This video is sponsored by Describe. This is part of a series of videos where I give you advice on how to build your D&D character. Today we're starting with our subclass. I actually recorded part of this video live on Twitch, so follow me at the link below to see that kind of content from time to time. If you're brand new to D&D when you're watching this, a subclass is basically a specialization for a D&D character. Characters have a class, like a fighter, monk, rogue, wizard, etc. And then the subclass helps focus in on what kind of fighter you are, what kind of monk you are, and so on. For example, some rogues are better at sneaking into places, and others are better at killing unsuspecting targets. This is captured through the rogue's thief subclass and the assassin subclass. Some clerics can cast different special spells that only they get because of their subclass. Some fighters have cool maneuvers or even special powers because of their subclass. A subclass is really designed to help give you a unique, specific experience. For example, I ran a game for four druids, and because each of them had a different subclass, they each had different powers. One had a focus on certain spells and tended to summon a lot of other creatures. One could turn into cooler animals than the others. One focused on environmental effects that helped buff the party, that sort of thing. Now, because so many of your characters' cool abilities come from their subclasses, I wouldn't recommend that two people in the party play the same subclass. You can have multiple bards in your group, that's fine, but if both of them have the same cool powers, they're not going to have very much fun. Now that you understand the nature of subclasses, let's get down to the pluses and minuses of creating a character starting with the idea of your subclass. The virtue of starting with your subclass is that it makes it much easier for you to focus on the meat and potatoes of what your character will be doing. Most of their powers and cool stuff is determined by their subclass. You might also use this process if you're starting your campaign or joining a group at third level or higher, unless you're playing a cleric, sorcerer, or wizard who get their subclasses earlier. For now, we'll see if that stays true for the next version of D&D. The drawback of this approach is that you potentially lock yourself into a plan for your character, unless you start at higher levels, which potentially limits your opportunities for discovery. But that might not be an issue for you. Some people like to have that roadmap. They like to know what their subclass is going to be, even if it's a couple levels away. And honestly, a lot of groups start at third level these days anyway, specifically because it gives people a chance to do their cool stuff earlier in the campaign. To a lot of people, the subclass is the juice. It's what makes you excited to play the character because it's when you get all of your cool powers. Last year, I made a video about the core fantasy for each class. It was something I needed to put out before I could make the video in this series about creating a character based on the class, which I finally got around to doing this March. So you might reasonably conclude that I should make a similar video before making this video about creating a character based on the subclass. And a lot of people who find that core fantasy video comment and ask me about making a video about the core fantasy for each subclass. But, well, listen, I'm not saying no, I'm never going to do that, but I don't think people really know what they're asking for. That video was over 20 minutes long. I talked about 14 different classes, each one generally designed to capture a different vibe. There are more than 100 official 5e subclasses. The last count I saw was something like 116. And aside from the fact that that's an intense amount of work, researching each subclass, comparing them to find the relevant differences that make them unique, finding movie clips to represent the subclasses, core fantasies in action. But also, I just don't think a video like that would be useful to a new player. It would be an information overload. I could see myself making videos like that separated by class. For example, one video covering the core fantasy of each bard subclass, one video about the cleric subclasses, etc. But if I did, I would probably time it for the release of 1D&D next year, since that sort of video might be more useful to new players picking up the game and trying to figure out the difference between subclasses. I'm not committing to that plan, but, you know, if you want me to do that, let me know in the comments below. Okay, I think that's everything you need to know about starting a character with their subclass. So, let's actually do it. Let's create a character. Let's jump into the Twitch live stream. All right, Twitch chat, let's, uh, let's create a character. And we're going to start with a subclass. So, I'm going to ask you, the Twitch chat, to... Choose a subclass. Ooh, okay. Super Z jumping in early. Said go for monk. All right. We have a early decision. Also, I don't think I've created a monk in a long time. So, um, yeah, this is going to be perfect because I don't know a lot of these um, super well. So, that is going to be a more authentic experience, I think. That leaves Astral Self, Drunken Master, and Mercy. I've got two votes for Mercy and three votes for Astral Self. I think, I think we have it. We're going to go with the way of the Astral Self. I don't know anything about the way of the astral self. Uh, so let's, I'm just going to read it. 
a monk who follows the way of the astral self believes their body is an illusion. They see their key as a representation of their true form, an astral self. This astral self has the capacity to be a force of order or disorder, with some monasteries training students to use their power to protect the weak, and others instructing aspirants in how to manifest their true selves in service to the mighty. Okay, so these people basically believe that their, you know, that all physical form is, is um, irrelevant, almost, or is just getting in the way. Um, forms of your astral self. The astral self is a translucent embodiment of the monk's soul. An astral self can respect, reflect aspects of the monk's background, ideals, flaws, and bonds. An astral self doesn't necessarily look anything like the monk. For example, the astral self of a lanky human might be reminiscent of a minotaur, the strength of which the monk feels within. Similarly, a monk, an orc monk might manif manifest gossamer wings and a delicate visage, representing the gentle beauty of the orc's soul. Each astral self is unique, and some of these monks in the monastic tradition are known for more for the appearance of their astral self than for their physical appearance. That's cool. All right, let's see what they get. Now, I know we're only going to do third level right now. I, I really only do start these characters at low levels, because the point is character creation, right? But I'm still going to look ahead and see what the other things are that they get, and I'll try not to, like read these all aloud because i don't think that's super good content um but by reading what they all do we'll be able to kind of get a sense of the theme of this subclass summon the arms of your astral self each creature of your choice within 10 feet of you must take a, a deck saving throw oh it's like a a little like thunder wave style thing not quite but it's, you know these arms hover near your shoulders or surround your arms you determine the arms appearance and they vanish early. So it starts with just your arms and it's not until sixth level that you manifest the entire visage. That's kind of fun. It's kind of fun to like develop that and see it sort of reveal itself. So at sixth level, you can summon this thing. It lasts for 10 minutes. That's really cool. Um, oh wait. So it wraps around you. Okay. Okay. Covers your face like a helmet or mask. You determine its appearance uh oh okay so it's only the head so it doesn't come out of you like an astral projection you can cause the body to appear um and it surrounds your body okay yep so that's the 11th level and then at the final level ah, i see awaken just gives you extra stuff at 17th level okay cool so you know what this reminds me a lot of is the x-men character armor you know it wouldn't be this big but Okay, that kind of helps, because that's, that's not what I was imagining, but I do like it. It's very cool. Um, tee -hee -hee. Okay, so we have a idea for the ast you know, of what the astral monk is like. I'm gonna start, then I'm gonna I'm gonna roll a couple stats, and then we'll uh, we'll take it from there. I'm sort of feeling out this this vibe, because how I would go next sort of depends a lot, but I think let's roll the stats first, because that's gonna tell us more stuff. Yishim. All right, well, they're fine. Dexterity, wisdom. Let's put constitution. So this is gonna be a lightweight little 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 babe. That actually helps a lot. That actually really does, believe it or not, help tremendously with what I was. Um, yeah, that actually unlocked something for me. This character does not have incredible stats, and we don't have their racial bonuses yet. We'll figure that out in a minute. But I think there's a fun to this that these stats and this subclass just unlocked, plus the connections we've made with armor, I think this is a young person. I think this is, you know, someone who's like 16, 17, maybe 18. These are not sorcerers, right? She's, you know, she's not an X-Men because a monk doesn't like just happen on these powers. This is something that developed through training, rigorous training. So this is an individual who has been presumably in this monastery for their entire lives. You know, sort of a ang. You know, like someone who has been training in the monastery, so they're very, very young, but they didn't just like magically get these powers. Ah, ha, 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 ha. okay, that got really interesting. Speaking of X Men characters, anyone familiar with Kid Apocalypse? It's okay if you're not. I. It's a very recent character. I say very recent. I haven't read comics in like 10 years, so they can't be that recent. I think this character was raised by monks because there's something about them that is scary. Because their ancestry or their or their destiny or their prophecy or something is frightening to these people. This is kind of a hellboy situation. 
is this a if I mark them down as a tiefling and then they're manifesting their form and it looks like an angel or something or maybe the other way around and this is somebody who's basically been told you have to develop and be this like rigorous best person because I'm just trying to think like what the interesting thing about someone going out and doing adventures when they're a child when they have been raised by monks their entire life I'm not locking myself into tiefling I'm going to look at all the options in a minute but hypothetically if this is a tiefling who's you know had some weird infernal heritage with like a very important devil and then this baby fell into the laps of these monks and they're raising this kid to be as good as they can i think that's a really interesting character uh not particularly original but interesting but it doesn't have to be a tiefling let's look at all of these and now a word from our sponsor Welcome to Great Moments in D&D History, presented by Artifice Gleam, Episode 5, Sci-Fi in D&D. In 1980, Gary Gygax wrote a D&D module called Expedition to the Barrier Peaks. In this adventure, spoilers ahead, the adventurers of a medieval fantasy world explore a cave that turns out to be a crashed spaceship, and the monsters are actually aliens or robots. This is a wonderful subversion of expectations that hinges on how the sci-fi elements of the world are described in such a way that the players did not know they were experiencing a science fiction world until much deeper into the adventure. This is an artistic challenge that is genuinely impressive, and it was very difficult for Gary Gygax to pull it off. How fortunate for him then that he had access to a time machine and had the ability to sign up for Describe. Describe is a wonderful service of professional writers who provide thousands of scenes you can read aloud in your game. You can find descriptions of monsters, locations, magic items, NPCs, even lines of dialogue to make your games more dramatic. And you can submit your own scenes for the scribes to write, or write your own and share them with the community. Gary Gygax got the help of the Describe writers when he was trying to figure out how to write his sci-fi adventure in the language of a fantasy game. And you can do the same! If you visit describe.com slash supergeek and use the promo code supergeek, you can save 10% off of your first subscription payment. Thus concludes another episode of Great Moments in D&D History, presented by Artivist Gleam. Once again, that's D-S-C-R-Y-B dot com slash supergeek and use the promo code supergeek. And you can be just like Gary Gygax. I'm, I'm jumping right back into this. It's like no intermission happened. Oh, I mean, the fact also that I think this character's stats are so low considering how they're third level now and that they have some notoriety, theoretically, you know, third level, you you already have like a bit of an adventuring background generally, kind of making them more sheltered, kind of using those stats to reflect the fact that they are really sheltered. Only a, you know, we know they're final. I guess these are the tiefling bonuses, but, you know, if they have a 10 or 11 in intelligence, 10 or 11 in constitution, that feels to me like someone who has been very sheltered oh charisma gets a bonus that's right if we go with tiefling well we don't have to keep that we can adjust it so let's actually look at the all the racial all the racial options you want he could be fun change then could also be interesting yeah you're right super z someone who with no external purity represented through their astral self that could be interesting i don't want to go with like orc you know i don't want to be like oh well this orc was raised to be good actually like y'all know my feelings on that uh <laughs> Not to say that it doesn't. You couldn't tell this story with an orc. I just think that's less interesting. Janasi's interesting, actually. Janasi. I mean, again, I've got all these legacy ones, so it's fine. It doesn't have to be all. These don't all have to be Adventurers League legal or whatever. I actually kind of like Janasi for this. I think I like Janasi because it could specifically be linked with something like an evil prince. An evil elemental prince isn't necessarily like the only thing you're going to be dealing with that campaign. That like that's sort of the issue with like. If you go with a demon, you know, if you're like, oh, this is the son of Asmodeus, right? In theory. That's what everyone's going to have to be dealing with the entire time. I feel like with the, the elemental, you have a little bit more flexibility. You're not tying everyone in the entire campaign into that, but also it gives you a fun excuse to go and visit other planes, which I think is cool. Um, I do like fire genasi for this. It doesn't have to be fire. Again, I'm basing this off of knowing the elemental princes from... Princes of the Apocalypse. And it might not be those. It could also just be a genie. And again, that's why I'm leaning towards like Earth or Fire because typically in the Monster Manual, those are evil genies. And 
I just do. I do like fire. I like the fire genasi because I'm getting like the tiefling vibes are represented a different way. And I was also thinking about maybe dragonborn and obviously fire genasi kind of hits some of those in a fun way. Let's look at earth. I just want to look real quick. Evil avatar. I mean, if, if not evil, certainly <clears throat> portended to be bad. Like I'm thinking Hellboy is a good example of that as well. You know, this is someone who like the prophecy says this person's going to be bad or at very least important. So somebody tried to put their thumb on the scale and make sure that they knew this person was going to be as good as they could or at least aligned with their ideals. Whether or not that's actually good, we'll we'll find out. I'm going to trust my gut. I'm going to stick with fire. I feel like 18 is appropriate. I feel like 18 years old is enough where like the character can go out, can do adventuring things, could like, you know, go to bars and brothels and whatever if that's where the campaign goes i have no idea if it would and it won't be like uncomfortable but they're also still very young especially for a third level character i think that's fun i think that's a good um age which means we know our um background god i gotta stop hitting that mic our background is acolyte the first one alphabetically super easy they were raised in a monastery like literally i think and i think they were taught celestial depending on where this character is in their journey is going to determine basically what their form looks like you know early on it might represent an angel or something like that as they go on and they begin to like figure out who they are figure out who their character is that might take other forms it might take the form of you know a leering devil it might take the form of a an azer or something else from the fire plane a salamander maybe a better example it might take on a completely different form it might look like their friends you know um and i think that's kind of fun and interesting and and tying it to someone who doesn't know who they are especially because this is to peel back the meta a little bit i haven't played a monk since the play test for D D, I believe um i think that's the last time i've played one summoning the arms could be the final test before being allowed to leave their temple yeah yeah it could be especially i think particularly this is something i've noticed that i did when i have an idea for a, a, a druid character that i would love to play in a, a longer campaign as I did the same thing, I made the character young because I think it gives me an excuse to get good at playing that character without having to like mess with the f fantasy of being a competent adventurer. You know, because it's it's always that feeling like when you're playing a video game and you know that like Batman would be better at doing this thing than I am, I'm just bad at it. That's the sort of like friction between fantasies that I have a hard time with when I'm playing a character I haven't played before. And tying it into an experience is a really good way for me personally who's not familiar with playing a monk and doesn't know all the things although I've, I've run for enough monks that i feel like i'd be able to feel it out to a certain degree but it would still be really really helpful to have that sort of safety net of yeah it's okay if i got this wrong because the character doesn't know everything yet um it's just interesting that i've done that again um but i think also this character's personality and vibe is very different although they are also a little bit of a chosen one. That's funny. I may need to bring that up in therapy at some point. I, I think the way that it's represented is still different enough that I would be okay with playing both of these characters. But I, I do like that this is, you know, someone who... And again, they don't have to be a chosen one. They, they could literally just be, oh, yeah, your father is someone evil. We didn't want you to be raised by them. You know, you are too important. And it might be, if not evil, they could be a prince you know, or princess or prince. I don't know what the gender neutral for that would be. You know, someone who would be very, very dangerous when they got to of it, when they reached of age or when their, their father trained them to do all the things. And yeah, that's really interesting. I do think they're nobility. And I think that by doing that, it basically means that the bad guy is not trying to kill them necessarily just wants to recruit them. Um, I think that's useful. I think that's interesting. Draconic down. I think that's useful. Ah, there it is. I've spent so long in the temple that I have pra little practical experience dealing with people in the outside world. That's literally what we were talking about. So yes, definitely. See what comes up randomly. Yeah, optimistic attitude. I like that. I think that's interesting, especially because I end up being so cynical and pragmatic in so many of my <laughs> characters. So here's the question. Did they leave because they were sent on a mission? Did they leave because they proved themselves to leave or did they sneak away? right is this just her you know because if the whole point is this person is meant to stay in the temple at all times because we think they may be you know uh, the elemental prince may be coming for them 
I feel like they wouldn't let them leave. So this may be, this may not be Wonder Woman getting access to leave because she won the bracelets and bullets challenge. I don't remember what the full thing is called. This might be Wonder Woman sneaking out in that movie. That kind of tells us some stuff, right? This is not, so the ancient traditions of worship and sacrifice must be preserved and upheld. I don't think that quite vibes. I'll try to help those out in need no matter the personal cost. Kind of gives me more. Like, leave on a mission from a vision, blessed with the arms as proof so leaders had no choice but to let them. But I like the idea that they snuck out because it means the other monks could try to bring them back. It's more friction, right? It's more factions out there that can be trying to, like, that they're trying to hide from, which is very difficult to do when you're a fire genasi. That's the reason, that's the reason that I like the sneaking out. Um, but again, this is, you know, the whole point of this process is that for your character at any point, you could feel differently and make a different choice. If I was creating this character, I would want them to be on the run from everybody. And I like the idea that they did that because they feel the need to help anyone because they know they have the power to do that. Ha 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 ha. Starhound, I really like that. Maybe they leave to help a nearby village under attack or something. Heck, boil in that they leave just before the arms ceremony because they go want to go out and do instead of staying and resting while others are in danger. That's great. That's really good. I like that they basically missed their next black belt. So, you know, whatever it is, the next um, training moment, the next um, display of their ability because they know they're just, they're not going to be able to leave if they stay, you know, and they want to go out and help people. Yeah, I really like that. Everything I do is for the common people. I like that. Now they need a flaw. I judge other, others harshly and myself even more harshly. Man, I really like that. Because consider how critical all of these mentors would be, right? Like, fiercely critical. Fiercely intense. Like, I really like the judging harshly. For now, I'm going to pick neutral good. But I would definitely be keeping an eye on that alignment as the campaign went on. I wouldn't be surprised if it bumps around every every time we level up. And just like as they're experiencing the world for the first time, I'll be really looking at what those experiences teach them about the world. Stealth, because they snuck out of the temple. Sure, why not? Let's pick a name. I don't like any of the ones that they're suggesting. Super Z, you said Shakia. I don't know the name. <laughs> I did not mean Shakira. <laughs> Complainants. Hmm. I like Shakia, just don't have a strong feeling on it. Names, meaning prince or princess that works too sadie sadie means princess i didn't know that sarai sarai's good is it hebrew so it's a version it is a version of sarah but sarai still feels very separate i like that soraya it means pleiades constellation okay well then it doesn't mean princess does it website what is the pleiades constellation oh constellation taurus i really like that so the myth of the bull which is where soraya gets its name theoretically, is when Zeus fell in love with the Phoenician princess Europa. He transformed himself into a white bull with golden horns and carried her away to Crete. Which again, you have this sort of like demigod vibe. I kind of like that. I think I'm gonna go with Soraya. It's it's very unique. It's not something we've we've heard a bunch of times in our D&D games. You want to give your DM a little bit more to work with than just they were at a temple, right? So follower of the dawn. Because they're a follower of the, um, Soraya is the name of skincare cosmetics around you. Um, let's see if that's around here as well. That's really funny. Okay, so not in our area. It is a singer-songwriter. Okay. It's not so common that I feel like we couldn't also use the character. Yeah, because what's this result? It's a movie. Okay, that is, that is always the thing. We're going to have to talk about this in another video for sure is, where do you draw the line on how much people might recognize a name? Um, and everyone's line for that is going to be different, and it depends on the situation as well. They were left at a temple. The others never saw who left them. Yeah, I think maybe. That's definitely... I think that's what they were told, is that someone left them at the temple. But then the question becomes, like they definitely know they're the child. I think this character knows that they're the child of a, a elemental prince, because they think they were told. So the question is, like, hey, how do they... Um, how do they know that? Someone's not telling her something. Um, I think it is very possible they went and found her and they got her from someone, you know. Now, that being said, I don't think that Soraya is on like a quest for her mom. You know, I don't think that's what she's doing. Um, if she finds her mom, great. She doesn't know who her mom is, but I don't think that's like, I don't think her, I don't think she's on a mission to find an absent parent. Um, 
because she has enough going on. <laughs> she has monks looking for her and possibly uh, an elemental prince looking for her. She doesn't need a third MacGuffin. Anything that happens story-wise will be fine. They don't necessarily kidnap all their kids, but like if she is, you know, a a, a kind of important kid, they might have taken it. I mean, listen, she's also got some Loki vibes, right? Loki is a prince of another nation, and Odin was just like, yoink, mine. You know, we only have his word that he was left to die, but he was also a prince's, you know, who's a prince. So I don't find Odin to necessarily be the most reliable narrator in the Thor films. No, I actually am going to do a tiny bit of min maxing here. Um, and we're going to move the intelligence over to wisdom because we should really get that score up, make it an even number. Yeah. Okay. I'm good with that. Soroya, follower of the dawn. I, that's a cool character. Another thing that occurred to me after I streamed is that you could instead make this character as an Aladrin. The Aladrin in 5e take on different appearances and powers depending on their mood, so pairing a soul projection with them could be really cool, but I think that would capture a very different feeling when I would be playing the character at the table. And of course, that's the whole point of this exercise. You will see points in this process where you would have made different choices, because none of this is set in stone, and I don't know, I think that's the fun part. So hopefully this video shows you how you could create characters using this method, and at least in part, inspires you to try this process in your own games, if you don't already. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to be a part of the process when I film videos like this one, follow me on Twitch. I'm trying to go live a bit more often, maybe even multiple times a week, but at the very least, once per week. If you like this video, please hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, and ring the bell to get notified when new videos come out. If you want to support me financially, I do have a Patreon. Every supporter who joins, even if they just join at $1 a month, gets me closer to unlocking cool goals I have in mind for the channel. If you can't support financially, I'd still love to have you join my Discord server. There is an awesome community of people who just love to play RPGs and want to start their own games and play games with each other. It's really wonderful. And if you want to stay up to date with the latest news, sign up for my newsletter to get those updates. All those links are in the doobly-doo below. If you want more advice on how to be a good player, check out my video on the different forms of metagaming. You might find it really useful. Until next time, play fair and have fun.